young surgeons in the homeland. I'm Rihanna, he's currently working as a consultant colorectal surgeon at King's College Hospital. I'm co-presenting or co-discussing this discussion, the topic with my colleague, Dr. Mohamed Tayyip, who's currently working at Northwest Anglia uh, NHS Trust, Cambridge. Yep. Next, dude. Um, just uh, nice two sketches, which we have been actually seeing from the first year uh, uh, of medicine. Uh, defecation reflects anatomy of the rectum, quite interesting and fascinating. Uh, a combined force between the uh, rectal muscles, uh, the inhibitory uh, impact on the sphincters, and uh, what I find is a crucial element is the puborectalis sling, which actually helps to create an inner rectal angle, uh, which helps with the functioning of the whole uh, reflex. Um, I'm just briefly telling this because this actually has a crucial aspect why people develop the rectal prolapse, whether some people have a um, tendency or predisposition that they are more likely to develop prolapse, um, and um, whether uh, these anatomical factors are the main contributing elements in the prolapse, especially the puborectalic sling and um, the anal sphincter or levator and eye muscle in itself. I find this very interesting to uh, when I was uh, uh, reading literature that even Hippocrates uh, between the time of 460 and 377 BC knew about the rectal prolapse. Greek colleagues have recently published this um, interesting paper. And interesting, the most interesting, interesting part between in that was that the Hippocrate has the same ideology where the prolapse happened, which we have probably have advanced, but he kind of got the idea why people get the prolapse because uh, Greeks were obsessed with the body, uh, body's perfect uh, impressioner view. And the prolapse for them was an imperfection which destroys the beauty of the body. Um, so they have a few treatment options they were using. Next. Um, we don't know the precise cause, but it's seen more in Hispanic uh, population 2.5 uh, cases per 100,000 population is a figure which Americans have published. Uh, six to six times more in the females and more in the fifth to seventh uh, decades of life. And incidence increases. As you can see, it becomes one percent after the age of 65. Interestingly or surprisingly, people thought it's more common in the multi paris female, but it's not. It's the other way around although it's seen uh, in women who had hysterectomy or had given birth to bigger babies. Uh, it has been seen in people who have long-term internal intersusception of the rectum, people with bigger masses or other pelvic organ prolapse like vaginal prolapses. People with mental health issues have presented more with these cases. And neurological diseases like Kodaikwana syndrome or Marfan syndrome as a connective tissue disorder has shown more presentation of uh, the prolapse. Uh, this uh, two um, photographs I've chosen to actually explain, it was Altemeyer himself in 1971 when he introduced or advocated his uh, um, renowned procedure. Uh, he also gave at the same time the theory that the rectal prolapse actually happens as a uh, progression of the internal rectal uh, intersusception, which keep, keeps on happening and at one point the rectum start producing out as a double layer of the whole uh, bowel wall. Um, and I think this, this theory is still kind of been accepted and um, uh, advocated by many uh, surgeons. Uh, some more theories which actually exist. Some people uh, had advocated the atrophy and separation of levator and I, but I think um, if you uh, uh, relate it to that with the prolapse itself, uh, rather being a causative factor, uh, atrophy and separation of levator and I happens due to persistent prolapse itself. Um, for surgery, people have, uh, these people have been found to have deep cul-de-sac as an anatomical anomaly, a long and redundant sigmoid, and also a patchless anus. In my uh, own um, observation, majority of patients have a patchless anus. Uh, and also patients, some patients have uh, been seen with a longer uh, mesorectum. I've written a little bit in one corner about surgery. Um, people have been seen that they have uh, fistula uh, surgeries, 
they have a damage to the uh, puborectal sling, if it's a higher fistula, that has led to the prolapse in those patients as well. Um, in 2020, a new um, theory has been presented. I find it very interesting. Um, it's kind of something which you read and think, oh, they have uh, stolen something from our orthopedic friends. But, um, but it is interesting. They have, what they have found is that the people who are presenting with the rectal prolapse, they have a, a more pelvic posterior tilt. Um, in my next slide, uh, if you want to concentrate, um, uh, what exactly the pelvic tilt is. I, uh, orthopedic or physiotherapists, they use a gonometer to actually uh, calculate a pelvic angle, which is uh, between your posterior sphere, alex spine, and anterior sphere, alex spine. And an imaginary line is drawn horizontally at the posterior spheric alex level. And if you look at it, um, the angle is measured between these two. And the angle, if the tilt is more posteriorly, automatically this angle will become smaller. And they have found that the people with, um, or patients with uh, prolapse have posterior tilt and their angle is less than 10. And normal people without tilt is 10 to 15 and anterior is more than 15. So that's an observation. If I can go back to my posterior slide, previous slide again, and they found a strong correlation that it does exist. Although they have used a PSM, matching um, a technique to exclude uh, the bias uh, because their numbers and figures are interesting that they found it in majority of those patients uh, among these 143 patients they have found uh, this um, uh, tilt Pro probably that is a, a strong associated factor which we never knew before and um, have found now so anatomically uh, these patients are prone to develop or this tilt help uh, actually leads to the intersusception, which leads to the rectum and actually it adds with the ultimization or theory. Yeah. Uh, quick thing, it sometimes is not very easy to diagnose these prolapses because when you examine the patient in the clinical setting, there's no prolapse. So you have to make them to strain. Investigation, I'm just touching it briefly. We do clonoscopy to exclude any other causes, especially uh, about cancer helps with the screening and defecatory pro proctogram, which does exist in our practice for quite some time. Initially, we were used to do fluoroscopic, now MRI has uh, taken its place. Some of these patients have also an element of incontinence. They do need an endoanal ultrasound to look at the anatomy of the sphincter itself and also EMG studies. Majority of these patients also have uh, constipation, so they do need colonic transit study. Just a little bit idea of, um, uh, with these photos, that if you look at the rest and if you look at the in this um, uh, 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 photo B, there is uh, an uh, posterior rectocele, which actually is a originating point of the intersusception, which leads to the prolapse. And at the bottom two figures, these are actually after the surgery. Right? Uh, MR proctogram, just to get, it does the same thing in the fourth figure, if you're a photo for image of the MRI, same rectus C causes more angulation. And that's basically is the nidus where the intersusception start actually happening. Uh, as you know, uh, uh, prolapse is two types, full thickness and uh, partial or mucosal prolapse. Mucosal prolapse is much easier. Um, I want to concentrate more on full thickness, which is, uh, uh, which needs uh, uh, management um, uh, strategies to be developed. You always uh, divide your patients into two major groups uh, with the low um, operative risk and the high operative risk. Majority of our patients say in the UK uh, fall into the um, high operative risk because they're old, they have few comorbidities, their ASA is above, four and five, uh, above three and four, and their performance status is not very brilliant. So they, they don't fit into the category of the abdominal approach. Although you can do actually uh, two options. If they have history of incontinence, you can offer them rectopexies uh, with sutures or mesh. Or if there is um, previous constipation, which may be due to the redundant long sigmoid, they will benefit more from resection. But our uh, area of interest in the subject we want both want to talk about is a, um, actually perennial uh, approach. Um, you have two uh, 
uh, famous ones. One is delumin, other is altamibid uh, levator plasty. Uh, uh, actually, it doesn't matter much if they have incontinence constipation. Those were the two procedures have shown the impact in those patients. Now, this recurrent prolapse is quite interesting because patients do develop recurrence and then they need um, uh, an option because it does affect their quality of life. That's why they come to surgeons anyway. If it's early and they're fit and healthy, you can offer them an abdominal uh, option, a vector faxi, stoma, that probably will give them a, a good quality of life. It's a frail patient and if it's a late presentation. If it's a late presentation, that prolapse is quite prominent, quite big. Uh, to fit patient, you can um, actually offer abdominal approach. But if they're frail, which is our majority pool, then you have this aside. If it's a small prolapse, up to 10 centimeter, you can actually repeat the loams. It may or, may or may not give you the, uh, the satisfactory results, or you can offer them an altamized. Dr. Thayeb actually is going to discuss in much more detail about those. Yep. This um, comparison, which has been um, produced by a Japanese colleague in 2018, basically gives you a development in the pathway or the management um, uh, cascade of uh, the rectal prolapse treatment. If you look at it, from 1891, we've been offering different procedures, whether it was anal encirclement, mucosal sleeve resection, or the in 1900, 1923, we tried mucosal placation and then rectosigmoidectomy by uh, Altamai in 1971 when he uh, gave his theory of the origin and also his famous procedure. Then comes the time we were doing, at the same parallel time, we were also attempting our uh, open approach. Uh, from 1922 to 1963, uh, whether it was Sadek or was it Repstein himself, who actually tried meshes. If you look at briefly here, you see that the recurrence was much better actually in uh, lateral mesh rectopexy as compared to the posterior anterior, but his mortality was um, much higher than the um, other two. And then came our uh, laparoscopic uh, era, and we attempted all these procedures laparoscopically. Uh, recurrence just varied from uh, between 4 to 11 percent among them. And in 2004, we start talking about ventral lactopexy, and but the recurrence is there. Um, and if you look at briefly, there is a morbidity involved with that, with the uh, rectal uh, pexy. That's what led people uh, to. Um, they react a little bit from these approaches and it kind of, it's going into the time where people have developing disliking or not very much positivity about these approaches. Yep. Um, just a, a same thing, the team in Japan actually have uh, presented this. It's a, it's, a, it's a combination of a few cases, it's not a single case study, the 15 cases they have presented and they've modified uh, the rectopexy with a suture with a single or double. Uh, they have, if you'll see, they have marked the length of the rectum, which was uh, they want to pull up. And after dissection and freeing the rectum anteriorly, they mark the point and then they put a, a suture at the anterior wall of the rectum and um, they have stitched to the sacrum. They have reported only one recurrence. It's just a little bit in my next slide. I want to uh, yeah, show you uh, the the classic original Epstein procedure, how he designed and he wrapped the suture around the rectum. And, and if you see it from the lateral view, that's how he probably tried to create an, an angle to the rectum and give us a more anatomical position to help with the defecation, but um, that was his original design. And Wells procedure, uh, where he used a polyvinyl alcohol gauze and left the gap in, at the anterior surface of rectum for a defecation to help. But whether what uh, whatever was the approach open in the original and uh, laparoscopic or robotic later on, it led to fecal impaction, strictures, sepsis, especially pelvic abscesses and fistulae, um, and, and adhesion formation. I have myself has operated some of these patients done many years ago. Those adhesions and fistulae are quite um, remarkable. 
this I uh, like. Um, uh, actually, if you look at our uh, um, uh, uh, colleagues have uh, compared the laparoscopic and robotic approach, because now we talk advancement and robot is here. Their, their overall view was if they compare the intraoperative, postoperative functional results, and they found that there's no difference. Both can give you the same results, low morbidity, acceptable long-term recurrence, and functional outcome. Um, so whether do laparoscope or robotic, you will achieve the same results. This is um, interesting. Um, I found it is interesting. As you can see, our Swiss uh, friends published this in 2010 and as a new technique. They use our simple linear staplers and a round curve stapler and probably it's an option which I personally think is a, a, is a good option for our very frail patients that you, in my next slide, I'm not going to talk a lot whether, although I have described that they looked at the um, functional results and compared their um, vaccine score, as you know, which is for the fecal incontinence. And they have uh, quite um, uh, impressive uh, um, uh, improvement from score of 16 to one in a uh, majority of their patients. If I go to the next slide, I'll show you uh, the technique, which is very simple. You are using a linear stapler and cutting at both ends, and then you create these two flaps. And I think you can even cut, do that with a linear stapler, but they have used a curved stapler. And, um, and their consensus was that it's for the frail, frail patient and the incontinence improves quite a lot. But my next slide will uh, show you, uh, this is their score. Um, so it, it, it does, in a, in a brief view, it gives you the, the, the results they were getting. And the, but the problem which I find is that the follow-up is only for two months. There's no long-term follow-up which they have presented. So we don't know whether what happened. This one is a next step of modification, modification done by Egyptian colleagues. Rather than using two staplers, they have used the same linear stapler and uh, they created the anterior flap and they have uh, the posterior flap and uh, financially probably uh, it's cheaper than the other option and their results which you can see in my next slide um, are also very good um, so this is probably the next advancement we are looking for um, uh, and, but um, yep some countries have tried um, to develop guidelines, you may can say this is a problem, this is the pathology, or this is a presentation which we get to see more in the West. That's true. And maybe before longer age uh, expectancy, they live patients long, live longer. Uh, well, they're, they're, these countries do need some guidelines. And if you can see that our Dutch um, uh, neighbors and also our uh, um, Italian neighbors have tried to develop uh, guidelines after reviewing the liter literature um, uh, thoroughly, and they have achieved them. And I think uh, for the for the for the surgeons or uh, national in those countries are, are going to benefit from them, and they can cre create a standard practice. After this, um, um, they probably can have a standard treatment. Um, I'll leave you all at this point because. Um, for some questions after Dr. Tayeb actually have elaborated you to the further uh, management options. Thank you. Is that time, Laga Tayeb? Yeah. The recording is done, Karas. Hmm.